After a week of mostly hearing from police officials, the public inquiry into the Emergencies Act will now begin hearing from organizers of the Freedom Convoy. Now to talk about this in more detail is political reporter and Toronto Sun columnist Brian Lilly, who joins us once again from Toronto. Brian, who will we hear from first? Well, the first organizer that we've uh, heard from so far is Chris Barber um, from uh, Saskatchewan, who was one of the early organizers. And you're right, we've heard from a lot of police officials over the last week. You know, first week it was residents and city officials, people like Ottawa Mayor Jim Watson, city manager, residents who said they were impacted by the convoy. Then a lot of police officials, current and former uh, Ottawa police uh, officers, we heard from Peter Slowly, the former chief, for full two full days of testimony. That's the longest anyone's testified. And, and now it's on to the organizers. So Chris Barber was up. Um, he you know, spoke with commission counsel first. For people who haven't been watching this, there's a lot of different lawyers that can question a witness. Commission counsel, they're there on behalf of the public inquiry. And their job is to generally introduce the person introduce any documents that go with them, such as a written report or a summary of their previous interviews. They walk through what are you could generally call agreed upon statements of fact. They ask some questions and then you get into the cross-examination phase. And with Chris Barber, a lot of the groups didn't want to talk to him, uh, but the Government of Canada lawyer did and that turned out to be pretty interesting. You know, there were questions about why Chris Barber became part of the Freedom Convoy to begin with. Some asked if there were maybe other political goals or people with ulterior motives who joined the convoy. What did he say? Well, he said that his goal was always to end the cross-border travel mandates. And, you know, the, there was a lot of questions about that. How did he get involved? And he got involved because somebody reached out to him and said, I'm going to lose my job over this. And, you know, Chris Barber is someone who's uh, you know, under the old definition, I don't know what the definition is now, but he's someone who would have been considered fully vaccinated. But he, and he said he was fully vaccinated because he runs an independent trucking company, didn't want to lose his ability to go across the border, but saw that he was losing drivers, that people who really didn't want to get vaccinated were at risk of losing their job. So he got involved for that. But there were a lot of questions, both from Commission Council, but especially pointed ones from the, the Government of Canada lawyer <clears throat> about other people getting involved, such as the group Canada Unity. They're the ones who um, joined on to Freedom Convoy 2022, and they had the what they called the Memorandum of Understanding. They were going to replace the government. Well, that's something that um, Barber said he was never a part of, that the, the core group behind Freedom Convoy 2022 were not part of. And then a lot of questions about Pat King, because there's always been this claim by some that Pat King was a key organizer, others saying he never had anything to do with it. The truth is somewhere in the middle. Pat King was part of the uh, organizing committee originally, but as we heard in testimony, during the, the, the move from Western Canada uh, to Ottawa, somewhere uh, by, by the time of the Ontario-Manitoba border, He'd been pushed out because Chris Barber, Tamara Leach, and others had serious concerns. They had originally, um, you know, when they were alerted to, to some issues about racist comments or violent comments, such as saying the prime minister will get a bullet to the head, they approached him. And he always had something to say. But over the following days, they saw more and more evidence and just told him, look, we, we don't want you as part of this. And at one point told him, we don't think you should go to Ottawa. But they weren't able to stop him or get him out, but he definitely wasn't part of the organizing committee by the end, even if he was at the beginning. So Brian, when will we actually hear from Tamara Leach, who many would argue was the main organizer of the Freedom Convoy back in February? Uh, she, well, she, and she's perceived that way, uh, due in part to some of the testimony we heard. Uh, you know, Chris Barber took on a different role, Tamara Leach took on the public facing role. He said to her, I don't wanna be in front of the cameras, and talking into the microphones at these news conferences, I'll stand beside you, but I don't want that. She took on that role. She, I would have expected that we would have, would have heard from her by Friday. It's really going to depend on how long some of these witnesses go. Slowly took a lot longer than I thought. They've added more witnesses, uh, which is only going to prolong things. So hopefully by Friday, but it could be early next week if some of these other witnesses do go long. 
Ryan, do you think we'll also hear during the public inquiry into the Emergencies Act the fact that the Freedom Convoy was not funded by the Russians like some media outlets were reporting? You know, I think that has been discussed a little bit already. And, you know, that story has been uh, debunked. The part that I, I could have actually believed because um, Russian bot farms for social media accounts jump onto all kinds of uh, uh, causes and their goal is to destabilize. And if you actually read the reports into Russian interference in the 2016 U.S. election that uh, President Donald Trump won, the official reports don't say that they were trying to get Donald Trump to win. That report said the same thing that Canadian reports have said and other Western countries. They jump in on causes that can do anything to destabilize Western democracies or sow confusion. So I wouldn't be surprised if there were you know, social media accounts doing that, but it wasn't funded by foreign actors, be it Russians or Americans. And, and that, unfortunately, is part of the media reporting that went on. And then that media reporting was used to justify invoking the Emergencies Act, because if you have wow. foreign interference, it's one of the grounds for calling mm -hmm. uh, invoking the Emergencies Act. Incredible. Brian, we will hear from other organizers on how and why they get involved in the Freedom Convoy. But I have to ask you something. What surprised you the most during the week of police testimony? How disorganized they were, how ill-prepared they were, how they weren't, Ottawa police especially, and Ottawa Police Service is what in their parlance they call the uh, police service of jurisdiction. You know, everyone thinks, well, it's Ottawa, so it's got to be federal police. No, once you step off Parliament Hill, as I've said before, and you know this well from living there and working there, you step off Parliament Hill onto the sidewalk of Wellington Street, that's where the protests were happening, that is local Ottawa Police Service jurisdiction. All they had to do was take in any media reporting on the convoy, watch their Facebook posts, and you would have known that they were coming for a long time. Read the intelligence reports prepared by the Ontario Provincial Police. They didn't do that. They did not realize that they were coming. They did not believe that they were coming for more than two days. And to hear senior officer after senior officer say that, but then also see the evidence that they were warned sometimes weeks ahead of time what was actually going to happen and that they just didn't do anything it is quite shocking. An interesting note that came up during Chris Barber's uh, testimony. <clears throat> We've heard a lot about why did they let the trucks onto Wellington Street? Uh, because, you know, they could have allowed the protest to happen and, 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 and the trucks wouldn't have been embedded. Well, Chris Barber was talking in his testimony about how they actually thought through their discussions with police that they were going to be parking elsewhere and then going up to Parliament Hill to protest, but not necessarily with all the rigs, all the tractor trailers. Uh, they arrived and Parliament Hill was already full. These were people who were not part of the official convoy, had not traveled from Western Canada or Atlantic Canada or part of the official convoys from Southern Ontario. He said he ran into some people he knew who were just in the area doing runs and decided to join in. So by the time the official convoy hit Parliament Hill, the street was already uh, full with rigs. Brian, will we also hear during the testimonies of the Emergencies Act here, if there were actually plants in the Freedom Convoy, you know, the Nazi flags, the Confederate flags, because a lot of the Freedom Convoy protesters we interviewed when we were in Ottawa said they were not part of the Freedom Convoy, but they were actual plants or maybe an extremist group that latched onto the Freedom Convoy. Will we hear more about that? You know, I, I think that would have come out during Ottawa Police Service testimony. And I, you know, I'll, I'll admit it goes from 930 in the morning till sometimes six at night or beyond. And I don't watch every single minute, but I haven't heard anything about that. I would imagine that would have come out during Ottawa Police Service testimony. And it didn't. That's not something the RCMP would talk about or, or deal with. And, and we're waiting to hear them that they'll be sometime next week, I believe. But you know, that could have absolutely have happened, especially with those flags in the early days. But Chris Barber, you know, first of the organizers up, did admit that, yeah, they had all kinds of people with bad ideas uh, trying to latch onto this. And I remember writing at the time, and, and I may have said it on air with you, that, you know, the, the convoy organizers had to be careful who was going to latch onto this, because you could see it happening. All kinds of groups with bad intentions, crazy ideas, racist ideas, or violent ideas saying, yeah, 
I'm going to go join that. And it, it, you know, Barbara said, look, we had one simple goal, get rid of the cross-border mandate. And uh, that's what we were there for. And anything else was uh, not part of our agenda. But it didn't stop the other groups from, from latching on. And when you look at what Pat King said, uh, why they shoved him out, and what he said while he was on the ground in Ottawa, he's definitely one of those guys who latched on, who you do not want anywhere near a political movement that you're trying to be successful with. What's the latest with Ontario Premier Doug Ford being called to testify? Is he fighting that subpoena? Uh, he is, and that was heard uh, today in the court. So uh, we should find out shortly on whether or not he will be forced to testify. Look, if I, I wrote that I think Doug Ford should go, but there are precedent reasons that he may want to fight this. He's also not key to the decision. This inquiry is not about Doug Ford and what he did. This inquiry is about, was the federal government justified in invoking the Emergencies Act? And in addition to that, and I don't think we've heard that, by the way, we haven't heard evidence to that. In fact, we've heard the opposite. But if you're going to call Doug Ford and say, well, we need to hear from him, then why aren't you calling Jason Kenney to ask him about coots? Why aren't you calling John Horgan to ask about the uh, the, the, the blockades at the uh, the border crossings near Surrey? Why aren't you uh, calling, uh, I actually can't remember if it was still Brian Pallister or Heather Stevenson at that point, in Manitoba uh, to ask about uh, what happened at Emerson? Why just Doug Ford? Is it about politics or is it about getting to that central question of, was the federal government, not the provincial, was the federal government justified in invoking the Emergencies Act, which states you can only use it if no other law will work. And of course, we've heard testimony and we've seen the, the text messages and emails from Brenda Lucky to the chief of staff for the public safety minister saying we have not exhausted all of our tools. Ontario's Emergencies Act gives us more tools that we haven't used yet. About 16 hours later, they invoke the Emergencies Act. I'm glad you brought up uh, Commissioner Brenda Leckie. During testimony from the Commissioner of the Ontario Provincial Police, we learned that RCMP Commissioner Leckie asked about using soldiers in mounted uniforms to clear out the convoy. Brian, is that even legal to do? You know, there's a good debate on that happening right now, and a lot of people shocked. We don't use soldiers to clear political protests in this country. And then hiding them in mounted uniforms? Uh, you know, Thomas, so she put this to Thomas Creek. Uh, the OPP commissioner in a text message, and he kind of walked past it without commenting too much as in, okay, I'm going to acknowledge this is here, but I don't want to talk about this is how I re read his reply, saying that that's, but he did say that's not something he would want to do, but Lucky thought this was a good idea. Of course, we also found out that she wanted to uh, switch her communications with the head of Ontario's provincial police to an app that would not record deleted conversations, meaning you couldn't dig them up in an inquiry. That's a, a request that Karik didn't even acknowledge from my recollection, just ignored and kept discussing business with Lucky. How Brenda Lucky is still the RCMP commissioner, given what we found out in this inquiry, given what we found out from the Mass Casualty Commission in Nova Scotia, is beyond me. Um, you know, I, I wouldn't be surprised if when this inquiry wraps, we get news that she is going to retire quietly to a rural location somewhere and leave policing altogether. Brian, we only have a few short moments left here, but I wanted to chat with you about later this week. We'll get a look at the federal books with a mini budget or a fall economic statement. Other than confirmation of a $90 billion deficit last year, what do you expect? I'm expecting to hear a couple of things, uh, and you could call one of them the Pierre effect or the Polyev effect. That's what we were calling it in the pages of the Toronto Sun. Um, Christia Freeland's been making noise that the government has to rein in spending and, and not just end COVID pandemic support payments, but actually, if you want new spending on other measures, you've got to cut somewhere else. That's what she's been telling cabinet ministers. So I expect to hear that. I expect to hear her concerns about a recession in Canada. You know, we, we did run a $90 billion uh, deficit last year. Uh, the most one of the more uh, recent monthly reports, the federal government had a $10 billion surplus. That's due to inflation in part, um, driving up their coffers and the economy bouncing back better. But I don't think that that surplus for the federal government or the many provincial surpluses that we've seen are going to be permanent fixtures. If we end up in a recession, we know the U.S. is in one now, a lot of uh, concern that we're headed towards one. 
What will that do to the government books? And will it prompt them to spend more again? Remember, this is a government that spends more in good times and in bad. If we're heading into bad times, are they going to start priming the pump again? That will only make inflation worse. So lots to look at on November 3rd. Political reporter and Toronto Sun columnist Brian Lilly, thanks so much for your time today. Thank you, Hal.